So today, I'm going to talk about some of the important obstetric complications. Means, what can what complication can occur during the process of labor or delivery, and how do we handle this situation? Okay, so let's uh, talk about this. And under this topic, three important problems we are going to discuss. These are prolapse, umbilical cord, shoulder dystocia, and perineal laceration. These are the common obstetric complication. So let's move further. Let's see this. Let's start with the umbilical cord prolapse. Now, one of the important points you need to understand is umbilical cord is the structure through which the baby is getting the blood. So what are the contents of umbilical cord first? What is there inside the umbilical cord? Yes? Two arteries, two arteries, one vein. Excellent. Excellent. Two arteries, one vein. Two umbilical arteries, one umbilical vein. And there is a jelly-like substance, which is known as Walton's jelly. Okay. So these are the important structure. If umbilical cord is compressed, okay, if umbilical cord is compressed because of the prolapse, the baby will not get any blood from the placenta. That baby will die or may die or high chance of death because of hypoxia. So because of this single point, this topic is important one. So this is an, please uh, mute yourself. This is an important obstetric uh, emergency. Okay, this umbilical cord prolapse. If the cord get compressed, the fetal oxygenation will be jeopardized with potential fetal death. Now, prolapse of the umbilical cord can be of different type. One is called occult prolapse. Another is a partial prolapse. And third is a complete prolapse. Prolapse means the umbilical cord is coming downwards, okay? But baby is still up. But umbilical cord is prolapsing downward. Occult means the cord has not come through the cervix, but is being compressed between the fetal head and the uterine wall. So this is occult, means hidden. We cannot see anything coming outside, but still it is getting compressed. Partial, the cord is between the head and the dilated cervical os, but has not protruded into the vagina. This is partial. And complete, the cord has protruded into the vagina. The complete is of course the most serious one, followed by partial, then the occult. Now one small question before I move further. If there is compression of the cord, which is known as occult cord prolapse, how do we diagnose it? How do we diagnose uh, when we examine the baby? Can we get some clues from the examination? Anybody? Sir, sir we can get an amniotic fluid yeah, this can and fetal distress. Because due to hypoxia for the fetus. Maybe it can be sure a sign of the fetal distress in that case. Very good. Okay, I already got the answer. Excellent answer. Remember, when the umbilical cord is compressed, the baby will suffer from hypoxia. And this is called fetal distress. So either there is fetal tachycardia or fetal bradycardia. That's the first thing. Second, after this, the baby may pass meconium inside the amniotic cavity. So passage of meconium is one, fetal tachycardia and fetal bradycardia, which are known as fetal distress is the another one. Very good answer, okay? So this is the way we can find out uh, whether something is happening inside the uterus or not. Let's move on. Now, see this. Look at here, uh, uh, this, look at this picture carefully. This is a complete umbilical cord prolapse. Now, complete means it has come into the vagina. That's why it is called complete prolapse. You can see this umbilical cord coming here. So there is a high chance of compression of this umbilical cord, you know, uh, in this region. Around the cervical rim or even when the baby come out, the head can easily compress it on the vaginal wall as well. This is a partial prolapse. You see this, it is not present in the vagina. This is the vagina. This is the per-digital examination. 
or for vaginal examination. Okay, so the examiner is feeling the presence of umbilical cord in the dilated cervical os. So this is the partial prolapse. Now, the important point in the umbilical cord prolapse, it should always be suspected when the membranes rupture and there is anything other than a well engaged head you can feel. Other than well engaged head. If there is a gap between the head and the cervical rim, then other structure like umbilical cord can easily come distally. Okay, so this is an important point. It should be diagnosed by a vaginal examination and sometimes it is suspected by a very irregular fetal heart. That's why the students answered. Excellent. An irregular fetal heart means either bradycardia or tachycardia. It should always be checked by vaginal exam and before rushing to fetal salvage, always ask yourself, will this baby live or not? Is this baby still alive or not? Or what is the chance of survival of this baby? That is a very, very important question you should ask to yourself. Now, if the fetal heart rate is still present, then the baby is still surviving. There's no doubt about it. But if I cannot detect any fetal heart rate with the help of fetoscope or stethoscope or okay, CTG examination or Doppler examination, then the baby is already dead. Now, one small question. If the baby is dead, how to deliver that baby? What do you think? How to deliver that ba that dead baby? That about the cesarean section. The cesarean section. section. Dilatation cortex. Okay. Wait for it. So. Now we do not use cesarean section because uh, we do not uh, want a scar on the uterus. Very good. Very good answer, Irfan. Good. So now this this topic uh, I have not discussed uh, this topic before. Don't worry, we will talk about this a bit later. But probably I talked somewhere, maybe you know. Uh, listen carefully. Once the baby is dead, okay, I want to deliver this baby through the conservative way. No surgery is done until and unless it is really necessary. Now sometimes it is necessary to deliver the baby by cesarean also if a normal vaginal delivery is impossible. But the baby is dead. You don't want to give a scar on the uterus after the baby is dead. Okay? So, no cesarean section as the first answer. You should answer, we should try to deliver the baby through the vaginal route. Okay? By inducing the labor. Okay? Or by using some drugs to induce the labor like prostaglandins and oxytocin. Or maybe by rupturing the membrane artificially. Or maybe by destroying the baby sometimes. If the baby is very big, you know, what they do, they, they destroy the skull, which is called craniotomy, or they cut the clavicle, which is called cleidotomy. All these different procedures are done to deliver the dead baby. So the very important question is, is this baby still alive or not? Then only your management should follow. Okay, so check for cord pulsation. Is this baby very premature or not? Try to decide that. And if cesarean is safe for the mother or not, try to decide that. But cesarean delivery is only done if this baby is still surviving. Uh, because cesarean delivery is a quick type of delivery. Uh, and natural delivery takes time. Okay. So if the baby is still surviving, I want to deliver the baby by cesarean section. Now, what are the risk factors of this umbilical cord prolapse? Why the umbilical cord may get prolapse? Let's talk about it. If there is premature rupture of membrane before the presenting part is well applied to the cervix, then there is a chance of uh, umbilical cord prolapse. Now, listen nicely. Usually, the presenting part is fetal head. If the fetal head is nicely, you know, applied on the cervical circumference or rim, Nothing can come out. No other structure can come out. There is no chance of umbilical cord prolapse now. But if it is not tightly engaged, if there is still a gap between the fetal head and the cervical rim, then 
umbilical cord, cord can get prolapse. That's the first risk factor. Okay, it is very common after the rupture of membrane. Second is malpresentation. Malpresentation means other than the head. Okay, like shoulder presentation from sometimes. Shoulder presentation, then uh, there may be a gap and then umbilical cord may come down. Now, what are the maternal causes and what are the fetal causes for umbilical cord prolapse? So let's talk about it. See there, please. These are the important maternal causes, like pelvic tumors. One of the important pelvic tumor is a fibroid. So what is the another name for fibroid? What we call a fibroid as another name? Anybody? Leo myoma. Excellent, Abbas. Very good. Leo myoma. Leo myoma. Leo myoma is the benign smooth muscle tumor of the uterus. It is commonly known as fibroid. It is very common in the uh, in that age. Okay, we call that reproductive age. If it is present in the lower segment, there is high chance. And narrow pelvis okay, also has a chance of umbilical cord prolapse because of the poor engagement of the fetal head. Regarding the fetal causes, prematurity, very small size baby, malpresentation like bridge, transverse line, and even multiple pregnancy. Bridge presentation is the buttock or lower limb presentation. Transverse lie, I talked about shoulder presentation. The shoulder is presented in the transverse lie. And in case of twins or triplet or quadruplet pregnancy, which are known as multiple pregnancy, most of the babies are very small there. Okay, And when the small baby is trying to come out, then the umbilical cord may prolapse because of the excessive space present there. Other cause, polyhydramnios, placenta previa, and even the large baby. Okay. So these are some of the causes. Most of these causes are associated with poor engagement of the presenting part. Let's move on. Now, how to manage it? Now, this is an emergency situation. Everybody know. And why it is emergency, that reason also you know. Then, how to manage? Do not hold the cord or try to push it back into the uterus. This may be, you know, disastrous for the baby. Do not hold the cord or try to push it back into the uterus. Rather than that, you should place the lady in knee chest position. Knee chest position. That knee chest position will not allow the presenting part to descend further and it doesn't allow the further compression of the umbilical cord. Okay, knee chest position. I'm sure you already know what is the meaning here. Elevate the presenting part if possible. Means try to push the presenting part further up. Why are we doing it? We don't allow that presenting part to compress the umbilical cord. Avoid palpating the cord. Sometimes the cord may, may you know, develop spasm. And sometimes you will further, you know, uh, when, when you palpate the blood flow to the baby will be further decreased. Perform immediate cesarean delivery. That's the only way. But remember, make sure the baby is still surviving there. If the baby is dead, don't go for cesarean section. But if the baby is still surviving or still alive, quick cesarean delivery has to be done. Catheter is placed in the urinary bladder and fill it with water or saline. That is done, of course. Uh, you know, it is uh, usually done after, uh, before any type of delivery. Catheterization is done there. And consider tocolysis. Now, what is tocolysis? What is the meaning of this term? Good. 
good good very good good answer we are used to the drugs like iv premature labor exactly we are used to stress premature labor exactly uh, many students are answering it quite correctly tocolytics are the drug which relax the uterus these are the drug which relaxes the uterus so that there is no contraction of the uterus and this is mainly done to arrest or to stop premature labor premature labor now remember prematurity is one of the uh, uh, risk factor for umbilical cord prolapse that's why we are doing it so nifedipine or salbutamol can be given and uh, other other uh, you know members of a uh, beta agonist drug also can be given like salbutamol terbutaline ritodrine and isosuprene these are the other member of the beta agonist drug salbutamol is very commonly used now all of you please pay attention on this on your screen see this is known as knee chest position now if we keep the lady in knee chest position see what is happening to this umbilical cord compression it is definitely decrease because the baby uh, the presenting part of the baby will not descend further downward rather it will go slightly upward so that there is no further compression to the prolapse umbilical cord okay so this is a one of the common uh, you know position which is attained in the situation another one is exaggerated sims position the the picture is uh, telling us everything pillows or wedges are used to elevate the woman's buttocks to relieve pressure on the umbilical cord this is another important position but niche position is usually employed now after uh, we talk about umbilical cord prolapse let's discuss another important obstetric complication that is known as shoulder dystocia okay shoulder dystocia now before we move further what is dystocia what do you mean by that anybody what is dystocia difficult or obstructed labor exactly i agree with him dystocia is abnormal labor you just remember this as abnormal form of labor is dystocia normal labor is known as eutocia u is normal you know uh it's you term is used for the normal processes not only in the delivery you know we we, we use the term u thyroid means normally functioning thyroid gland u thyroid so similarly okay eutocia normal delivery or labor dystocia is abnormal labor so if a shoulder is the presenting part which occurs in transverse lie if there is a difficulty in the delivery of the shoulder after head has already come out then the term shoulder dystocia can be used now see here what is the meaning or in which case shoulder dystocia is diagnosed when extra steps are required to deliver the shoulder or a delay of more than 60 second between the delivery of head and shoulder then we use the term shoulder dystocia most commonly it involves the anterior shoulder which impacts over the symphysis pubis okay so anterior shoulder is the usual uh, you know form of shoulder dystocia rather than the posterior one so let me revise a little bit because you probably have forgotten about the different process or mechanism of the labor or delivery so remember after the head comes out okay it is the anterior shoulder which is delivered first the anterior shoulder is present just behind the pubic symphysis so we just you know pull it to deliver the anterior shoulder and then we we extend the head so that the posterior shoulder is delivered and after that the trunk is delivered which is quite easy now regarding the incidence of shoulder dystocia it occurs in 1% of the deliveries all over the world it may result in permanent neonatal neurological damage in 2% of the cases now why is this because it may be a cause of obstructed labor okay it may be a case of obstructed labor 
until and unless the chest is you know delivered the baby cannot breathe the baby cannot breathe because a uh, chest is still there inside the birth canal we are talking about inability to deliver the shoulder of the baby now that's why because of permanent hypoxic damage to the brain of the baby there is a chance of neurological damage this is the meaning around 0.58 to 1 percent okay of normal birth weight infants suffer from shoulder dystocia so it doesn't only occur in big baby sometimes even the normal birth weight baby are having shoulder dystocia and quite naturally it is much more common in big baby now the meaning of big baby is more than 4000 gram or more than 4 kg weight at the time of birth so if it is more than 4.5 kg look at the percentage 5 to 7 percent of those will have shoulder dystocia one important practical information for you if ultrasonographic examination clearly tells that this is a big baby we don't take any chances regarding the normal delivery okay we take this baby for cesarean section and there is nothing like shoulder dystocia in case of cesarean section okay don't take any chance don't say oh i am i can deliver this baby nothing like that we we we, we may suffer from some complication there there are many risk factors and it is now agreed that the condition is basically unpredictable. It can happen to even normal birth with infants. So we need to be aware of the situation. Now, let's talk about what can happen to the mother okay, and the baby regarding shoulder dystocia some of the points you already know okay. and see here what other things can happen these are called sequelae or long-term problem one is maternal trauma maternal trauma like soft tissue injury third and fourth degree perineal tear can happen because of the you know quick delivery of those babies symptoms from symphysial separation can result because of prolonged dystocia it may damage the symphysis pubis that is called symphysial separation and even femoral neuropathy can occur to the mother femoral neuropathy is a damage of the femoral nerve so these are the problem done to the mother postpartum hemorrhage can occur okay postpartum hemorrhage this is a very important point problem in third stage of the liver excessive bleeding we call it pph or postpartum hemorrhage fetal brachial plexus injury can result uh, remember what is the mechanism for this damage or injury now please listen properly once the shoulder got stuck the person who is present there will try to deliver the shoulder anyhow so they may unnecessarily extend the head or the neck okay so during that time there may be stretching to the brachial plexus which can result in brachial plexus injury see there okay the chances is in in about you know six type of uh, six uh, you know cases of shoulder dystocia there may be one case where fetal brachial plexus injury can occur so the ratio is one to six now what happens if brachial plexus is injured what happens Basically, the brachial plexus take the and, and take the nerve, nerve impulse from the uh, 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 set to, set the to the upper limbs. Uh, so there will be there will be palsy in the hand and arm regions, sir. In the complete arm regions, I mainly. Exactly. Okay. So you Clem, can see. Clem keys paralysis, sir. Okay. Good. Very good. Different terms are coming like herbs paralysis, clumcase paralysis, and paralysis of the upper limb. All those answers are correct here, okay? I can accept those, though the mechanism is a bit different in each of them, 
but but these are the problem all of them can happen because of bracket plexus injury you can simply say there is weakness of the upper limb because brachial plexus is responsible for the innervation of upper limb okay upper limb fracture of the clavicle or even fracture of humerus canal now this is a serious type of injury and even fetal hypoxia can occur we already talked about this because of the prolonged or obstructed labor so these are the sequelae of shoulder dystocia now these are the risk factors for shoulder dystocia to occur means these are the situation where shoulder dystocia uh, you know has high chance of incidence see this even though the incidence increases with the birth weight half of the shoulder dystocia occur in fetuses who are less than 4000 g so repeatedly we are talking the same thing it can occur even if the baby is having normal weight don't think only the baby who are having larger birth weight okay suffer from shoulder dystocia so that's a very important point so you should be ready for the situation it can occur to anyone though the chances are much higher in the baby who are having increased birth weight large baby okay where symphysis fundal height is more than 42 cm definitely uh, you know important risk factor this is you know uh, the fundal height you can say okay fundal height which is measured from the pubic symphysis upward isn't it so if it is more than 42 cm it shows the baby is really big there one of the indicator of large baby another way by which we diagnose large baby is by ultrasonography if there is a past history of shoulder dystocia then it can reoccur again obese mother okay has a high uh, chance of shoulder dystocia and obesity is uh, defined as bmi more than 30 diabetic mother with or without fetal macrosomia has high chance of shoulder dystocia now this this a diabetic mother it can be of two type one is called gestational diabetes and another is called chronic diabetes okay gestational diabetes and chronic diabetes now gestational diabetes if she is you know pregnant then there is high chance of delivery of big baby and the term used for the big baby is macrosomic baby whereas in case of chronic diabetes the chances of iugr is more in the baby now you may be wondering why is so isn't it both are the cases of diabetes so a uh, lesson i am going to explain the situation here gestational diabetes means the diabetes is present during this pregnancy so duration is not longer so probably a lot of long term complication still has not occurred in that mother okay so as a result of this what happen now is see here there is excessive uh, you know glucose delivery to the baby because this mother is diabetic this mother is having uh, excessive glucose level in the blood all the time so that glucose is crossing the placenta and the baby is also having excessive blood sugar level now that excessive blood sugar level is stimulating the pancreas gland to release more insulin okay more insulin what type of hormone is insulin anabolic anabolic hormone very very good term i want to hear that term actually very nice anabolic hormone now this this anabolic hormone known as insulin will synthesize okay uh, uh, more amount of carbohydrate okay inside the tissue means the glucose is entered into the tissue and that glucose is synthesized or you know converted into glycogen that is the job of insulin more proteins are synthesized and fats are also deposited in different parts of the body that's why it is called anabolic hormone so the overall size of the baby will become big 
This is the reason for fetal macrosomia. Never forget it. Whereas in the chronically diabetic mother, there may be already some complications developed. That complications, one of the complications is atherosclerosis. And that atherosclerosis would decrease the blood flow towards the baby. So that baby has high chance of IUGR or intrauterine growth retardation baby. Okay. So the uh, rest of the thing we'll discuss in the respective topic. After assisted delivery of the fetal head, there is a high chance of shoulder dystocia. Okay. Assisted delivery of the fetal head means either vacuum or forceps delivery. We'll talk about that in our next topic. Now, how to manage this case? How to manage uh, a case of shoulder dystocia? See this, okay? All of you, please pay attention on the screen. There is an, one maneuver which is known as Mac Roberts maneuver. What is this Mac Roberts maneuver is all about? So the, the examiner or the person who is present there, okay, so the doctor, nurse, or whoever, okay, uh, the birth attendant or whoever, should give suprapubic pressure. And during that time, the maternal thighs should be flexed. So maternal thighs should be flexed, and we should give suprapubic pressure there. This suprapubic pressure will dislodge the anterior shoulder, okay, in case of shoulder dystocia. Because where is the anterior shoulder usually located? Just behind the pubic symphysis. So if we give a bit of pressure there, we, we, we want this uh, anterior shoulder to come out, okay, from the birth canal. This is known as Macrobus maneuver. You see this? Look at the Macrobus maneuver here. Take a bit of time, please. So how, how it is done, okay? So let me explain once again. Look at the, you know, uh, flexion of the thigh in the mother, okay? Look uh, at this pressure in the suprapubic area. At the same time, the head should be manipulated and uh, we hope the anterior shoulder which is present right after or beyond or behind the pubic symphysis would come out easily. Mac Roberts maneuver. Another uh, maneuver is also there, which is known as, known as Woods Cork Screw Maneuver. Woods Cork Screw Maneuver. Now, the term Cork Screw means it is almost like you know rotating the screw there. Okay, so this is done by internal rotation of the fetal shoulders to the oblique plane. Internal rotation of the fetal shoulders. To the oblique plane and we hope uh, the shoulders can be easily delivered. So this is Wood's Cork Screw Maneuver. This is just the end of the way. This is the Wood's Maneuver, okay. So it should, should be rotated and then it, it would come out. Now, after the delivery of anterior shoulder, how to deliver the posterior one, isn't it? That is another uh, important question which would be, would be asked to you. Now, you should gradually extend the head. Okay, You should gradually extend the head towards the mother's abdomen, then the posterior shoulder along with the posterior arm is delivered. It is not a very difficult type of procedure. And after both shoulders are delivered, the body will follow. The body is having a smaller diameter than that, so the body will follow easily. Okay. So this, this is the delivery of the posterior shoulder. There is the anterior shoulder. This is the delivery of the posterior shoulder. Now, one important question which will be asked to the students: If all of this procedure failed, okay? If shoulders cannot be delivered at all because of this different maneuver, like Mac Roberts maneuver or cork screw maneuver, then what is the last resort? What can we do there? 
now these are destructive type of surgery these are called destructive surgery okay like symphysiotomy and cleidotomy now symphysiotomy is what is the meaning just just Sorry, analyze the term the cartilage of pubic symphysis is divided. Excellent. Very good answer. So we cut the symphysis pubis. We make that birth canal wider so that we hope okay, it will be easier for the delivery to occur. Symphysiotomy. And cleidotomy. What is the meaning? Cleidotomy? Yes. Surgical, surgical division of the clavicle. Exactly. Surgical division of the clavicle. You cut the clavicle. You, you fracture the clavicle. That's the meaning. And when the clavicles are cut or fractured, remember, the diameter of that region would, would become smaller. Okay? And the baby can be, you know, taken outside. One more way is called Javanelli maneuver. Javanelli maneuver means pushing back the fetal head inside the uterus. Okay? or inside the abdomen, I should say, rather than uterus, because the baby is still inside the uterus, it has not come out. So, from the birth canal, the head is pushed back up, okay, towards the abdomen, and then the baby should be taken out by cesarean section. If the baby is still surviving, if the baby is dead, then cesarean section is avoided as far as possible. This is known as Javanelli maneuver. Now, the last part of this topic, okay, the important topic, uh, where uh, the chance of uh, obstetric complication are laceration. This laceration, we already know what is the meaning of this term in surgery. You have recently studied about this, but in the context of delivery or labor, we want you to understand this as a perineal laceration or laceration of the tissues which are there which are associated with the process of birth. So vaginal, cervical, vulvar, and perineal laceration should be identified by careful physical examination after his delivery and should be repaired if they occur. This is the job of the obstetrician there. After the delivery is done, she should check or he should check whether these tears or laceration have occurred or not and then properly repaired. Now, let's classify these different types of laceration. These are, okay, first degree, second degree, third degree, and fourth degree lacerations. Now, what is the meaning? First degree involves only the perineal mucosa. Second degree involves the muscles of the perineal body. Third degree involves the rectal sphincter, but not the rectal mucosa. And the fourth degree is the most severe one, it involves the rectal mucosa as well. And there is a high chance of fistula formation if we do not uh, properly resuture it again. Okay, so they, all of these different type of perineal laceration can occur during the labor. Once again, let's talk a little bit about the perineal lacerations regarding the types of perineal laceration which can occur during delivery. The first degree, second degree, third degree, and fourth degree tear or laceration. A first degree is the most benign one, and fourth degree is the most severe one. The first degree involves only the perineal mucosa and can be managed conservatively if they are not bleeding. Second degree involves the muscles of the perineal body. Now, perineal body is a structure which is present in the perineum, both sex, male as well as female. This perineal body is present right in the middle of the urogenital triangle and the anal triangle. Okay, and there are lots of muscles which are attached at that perineal body. The, the anal sphincter, the superficial and deep, you know, transverse perineal muscles, and even the bulbospongiosus muscle, all of these are attached at the perineal body. So, what is the meaning? The second degree uh, perineal tear involves the muscles of the perineal body, but it doesn't extend to the rectal sphincter. Whereas the third degree involves the rectal sphincter, but not the rectal mucosa, and the fourth degree involves the rectal mucosa, and we need to be very careful in the treatment of this, because if we, you know, 
um, do not uh, suture it in the proper way, there is a high chance of formation of rectovaginal fistula. Just analyze the term rectovaginal fistula. There is a connection development between the rectum and the vagina. So this is because of the improper treatment of the fourth degree tear. So let's uh, see some of the pictures, okay, and try to understand these different types of tears. First degree laceration or tear, see this, the perineal mucosa is one the term, okay, other tissues are not affected. So it inverts the forceps, it is known as the posterior forceps, perineal skin and the vaginal mucous membrane, but not the underlying fascia and the muscle. It can be repaired very easily, okay? It can be repaired very easily after the process of labor. Second degree laceration, okay, in addition to this fascia, and, uh, you know, in addition to these uh, different structures which we just listed, some other tissues are also torn. Those are muscles of the perineal body. But please make sure the anal sphincter is not torn here. Let's see this. This is the way it, it extends backward. Okay, the different muscles are involved. Third degree laceration extend further to involve the external anal sphincter now. So the external anal sphincter is affected. You can clearly see on the picture. And the fourth one, even the rectal mucosa is got turned. This is the most severe one. Now, all of these different types of tear develop because of precipitous labor. Precipitous labor means very fast type of delivery. That's why, uh, if you remember, I clearly told you during that time, one uh, a hand of the person who is helping that delivery process should push upward uh, when the head is about to be delivered. It should be delivered uh, along with some control. We don't allow the head to come out suddenly, you know, with one push and the whole body follow that. It will result in severe laceration or tear of the perineal region. And if it happened, then only one treatment is left, that is re it again very properly, okay? And the fourth degree laceration is very uh, sensitive one because of the high chance of fistula formation. So suturing has to be done with utmost care, with utmost care. With this, okay, we have uh, concluded these uh, important types of, you know, obstetric complications.